Hello, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. We're glad to collaborate with Mida on this special day and host this timely session. I am Baba Kapasade, CEO of Toronto Center uh, for our webinar, Using Data to Close the Gender Gap. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, Anishinaabeg, Chippewa, Haudenosaunee, and the Vendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuits, and Métis uh, people. So that's the home of Toronto Centre. This year, Toronto Centre is turning 25. Silver anniversary is a significant milestone. Since our establishment in 1998, we have trained more than 20,000 supervisors from 190 countries and territories um, on both financial stability and financial inclusion challenges that these officials face. We are committed to increasing the capacity of regulators and supervisors to build more stable and inclusive financial systems, which contribute to economic prosperity and underpin the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Our mission is generously supported by Global Affairs Canada, Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, and the IMF. Women's ability to save, borrow, and control their money and to insure themselves and their assets reduces poverty and promotes better health and nutrition outcomes for their families and their countries. Through our various programs, we have known for some time that there is a persistent gap, gender gap, between men's and women's usage of financial services and risks faced by women and men in personal, family, business, and financial decisions which are different for each. Our Gender Aware Supervision Toolkit, which was generally, generously supported by USAID, confirmed that there is also insufficient sex disaggregated data on which supervisors and financial services providers can evaluate and act. Prevailing research shows that using sex disaggregated data can make a difference by better understanding the needs of women and girls, promoting digital inclusion that extends financial services to poor and rural women, and enabling proportional risk-based supervisory approaches to such requirements as KYC Know Your Client. According to the IMF, risks to financial stability increase when access to credit is expanded without proper supervision. Unfortunately, countries with the biggest gaps in financial access inclusion also tend to have the lowest supervisory quality. So investing in high quality supervision can pay big dividends as financial inclusion expands. In this context, employing the toolkit is a key for authorities to begin integrating gender and technology into their supervision. Supervisors must strike a balance between mitigating risks to financial stability while promoting innovation and protecting consumers. Our training programs are designed to help supervisors address those challenges. And today we'll get the benefit of the panel's perspective on this and various other related issues. I would like to spend, uh, you have seen their bios, but I just like to mention them. Uh, Petronella Ditma is a program leader for Toronto Center and the founder and managing director of Master Seed Advisory. Veronica Herrera is a CEO of Microcredito. And a big welcome uh, to you speakers and also to our moderator, Lindsay Wallace, Senior VP, Strategy and Impact at MIDA. And MIDA is a very good partner of Toronto Center. You have received our bios, as I mentioned. And uh, to save time, um, we won't be reading it. Thank you. And I really hope you enjoy this panel. Lindsay, I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Babak, and uh, thank you very much to you and the Toronto Centre team, and happy anniversary. Um, as Babak mentioned, I'm Lindsay Wallace, Senior Vice President, Strategy and Impact at MEDA, and at MEDA, we're an organization that provides know-how and capital to agricultural businesses and financial services providers, and we're actually also celebrating an anniversary this year. It's our 70th anniversary. Uh, gender equality is a big focus of our work, so I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating this panel on International Women's Day. 
Um, as noted in the chat, just to say that there will be time for some question and answers at the end of the session. And so I encourage everybody as ideas and thoughts come up to please put your um, questions and answers in the uh, in the box down at the bottom of your screen. And as well, the panel will be simultaneously translated into French and Spanish. And so to access the translations, please just click the button at the bottom of the screen that has an interpretation. And just before we move to the panel, um, a couple of points on International Women's Day and the theme of digital innovation and technology for gender equality. Um, and Babak touched on a, a few of these, but we do know how important digital innovation has been for the financial inclusion sector. But we know that there remains a significant gap, both the digital gap and a financial inclusion gap. And there's more that we can do to support women's digital financial inclusion. We know that there's a great opportunity to increase access through these channels, but that we need not just access to the tools, but also the appropriate products and services. And as we'll hear, we know gender disaggregated data is such a critical um, important step to help us address this gap. We know that when uh, supervisors and financial services providers gather and uh, collect and analyze gender disaggregated data, it can really help them to design new products and to really understand the nature and scale of financial inclusion in their countries. We also know that the when supervisors and regulators in particular collect gender disaggregated data, they can then work closely with their uh, financial services providers in country to really help understand um, what types of products and services are a particular need for women, and also really help to encourage the greater inclusion of women into the economy through financial inclusion. So some big challenges that we've laid out ahead, but one thing that we also know, and it's exciting to be here on International Women's Day, is that when women uh, women are at the, the helm, when women leaders are um, given the, the opportunity to take charge, they're also much more likely to reflect and uh, address some of the challenges facing uh, women entrepreneurs and uh, financial services providers that focus on women. And I'm thrilled to have two fantastic female entrepreneurs here today. Um, as mentioned, we're delighted to be joined by Veronica Herrera, the CEO of Micredito, uh, an important MFI in Nicaragua and Central America, and as well Petronella Ditima, a program leader at Toronto Centre, but also an entrepreneur leading a very well-known advisory service in the financial inclusion space, and importantly, the author of the toolkit on sex disaggregated data that the Toronto Centre put out recently. So without further ado, I'm going to ask the panel to reflect on some of these issues. And as mentioned, please, as ideas come up, put some of your thoughts into the Q&A box. So first, I'm going to turn to Veronica. Veronica, as a leader of a financial services provider, what was your motivation and journey in addressing the financial needs of women in your company? And what are the implications for you, your management team, and your frontline staff? And feel free to, to tell us a little bit about Micredito and um, some of the work that you've done. And of course, Micredito has been a longstanding partner of Mita, so we're delighted to have you here today. Okay, thank you, Lisa, and thank you for the Toronto Center for this uh, invitation and this special day. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about Nicaragua. We have 45% of the population is living in the poverty. Uh, secondly, is the unemployment of women is 45% is higher compared with the men's. And a little bit about Migredito. At this point, we have, uh, we offer microfinance to make a financial inclusion for, in general, for rural area with focus in, in microfinance and microfinance. So we pretend or we want to empower women through the financial inclusion. Um, talking about this, uh, how is the challenge in Migredito? What is the uh, our, our reason or motivation why we decide to service women? There are two reasons. One reason is a personal. I was born in the west of the country in a very poor rural area. 
is my personal passion to serve women and have chance, have better opportunity to them. And secondly, I know Mida uh, years ago, and it's a very similar passion between Mida and Micredito. So this is the motivation why we want to improve the capacity of the women. Um, uh, the second reason, as I mentioned, also in Nicaragua, or in, in Central America in general, but especially in Nicaragua, the poverty is concentrated in the women. Um, what is the challenge in our main team? It's not a challenge, I will say it's an opportunity. Uh, we decide to hire more women than men. It's not, no, uh, it sounds like discrimination, but it's not. We try to bring more uh, women in the team, 78% of the employee actually is our women. And the reason is because we understand the DNA of women is the main reason why we hire um, capacity, but also we prefer women. Um, the, in the beginning, it was not easy, especially with the men, because the men prefer to improve, to protect in their solidarity is, is, is currently that they are solidarity between them. So we say we re-entrain, we focus on the gender policies and those aspects to improve the capacity to service women. Thank you, Veronica. That's really helpful and, and such a great uh, story. And, and, you know, and we see throughout the sector that greater women or a greater number of women employees has a greater and oversized impact on the number of women clients. And it's a bit of a, a positive uh, cycle. Um, Petronella, turning to you as a longtime expert in financial inclusion for women, can you tell us a little bit about your work in developing the Toronto Centre Gender Desegregated Data Toolkit and some of the main takeaways uh, of the country pilots? Because I know there was a lot of theory behind it and a lot of uh, reflections, but you know, it's only once things get applied on the ground that you actually find out what's working, what's not working. So yeah, I'd love to hear more about, about what you've learned. Great. So we uh, thank you very much, Lindsay. And uh, we did this. Uh, we started off with before the toolkit. We actually did a study. So um, the study and there is a publication to it. And the study was really looking at the intersection between technology, gender, and um, uh, uh, supervision and regulation. So as you can see, these are like three big topics on their own, like really looking at technology and how you can use technology to drive the women inclusion agenda, but not only just do that, but drive it from a regulatory perspective. So it was really like layering a number of things together and um, it was a very interesting uh, work that we did. And we did it in four countries. Um, you may be aware of this, Lindsay. We covered Kenya and Zambia, and we covered Colombia and Peru. And those were the pilot countries. So we set out to understand where they were. Uh, you kind of loaded it. So I'll go into the, into the uh, what are some of the key takeaways. So what did we find out? Um, one of the findings was, as Mr. Babak said right at the beginning, is that there isn't as much sex disaggregated data. And I think a lot of the participants will say, what, there's a lot. Yes, if you go to Findex, if you go to um, different sites, uh, FinScorp in Africa, they're doing a lot of work around sex disaggregated data. But what we were looking for was a systematic way of collecting data, not by anybody else, but by the regulator where they're actually collecting it from the financial service providers. And they are not just collecting it, but they are analyzing it and using that sex disaggregated data to inform policy, one. Secondly, maybe to inform even the way they will do regulation and supervision. So I, I, 
I think as, as the webinar continues, I will have a chance to explain what I mean by that. But let me give you another uh, takeaway. What did we find? We found out actually that there is a lot that's going on, maybe at the collection stage. So there is in some jurisdictions collection of data. So what was missing? What was missing was the analysis. In some countries, they actually said, the FSP said to us, we actually wonder because the regulator collects this information, but we never really get the feedback. We don't even know what they're using it for. So there's kind of like a black box. There's lots of information being collected, but maybe it's sitting somewhere in the regulator and they don't exactly see how this information is being utilized. So I've, I've gone like really um, high level and I hope as the discussion continues, I'll be able to dig deeper into, into some of the discussions. Um, so I would highlight those two as what we actually found out, and then I can talk about takeaways and reflections later on, is, if that is fine. Over to you, Lindsay. Yeah, thank you so much, Petronella. I'm actually going to come back to you on that, though, just saying, you know, you've got a very strong sense from both the supervisor's perspective, but also that very practical on the ground, how do FSPs and, and you know, financial service providers of all kinds actually leverage their data. And so what are what from what you've seen are the biggest opportunities for supervisors to leverage data for women's access to finance, building on the need for for deeper analysis? Um, and, and what are some of the other um, challenges or, or barriers that that you see? You know, I think it's it, your point about um, we do have the FINDEX and the FinScope, but of course, those are, are big, you know, sample data sets. It's a very different thing than a regulator saying, okay, what's actually happening here in financial inclusion in, in my country? And then making that a, a requirement as part of their supervisory duties. So yeah, just mm -hmm. a, a little bit of a reflection on the opportunities. And again, thinking a little bit about some of the different countries. Um, was there any of the four that really stood out or anything that, that we could all learn from, from some of the, the countries that were pilots? So it was Thanks so much, Lindsay, for that. And um, there the were opportunities, definitely. And there were areas where we were like, oh, this could be taken to the next level. So I will explain two. The first one was a lot of data that was being collected on um, uh, access to credit, and it was actually sex disaggregated. So we were really excited. Yes, data is being collected, is sex disaggregated, but there wasn't uh, enough of, okay, we have actually done this over the years, and we have realized that the FSPs are failing to reach more women because of this issue. And so let's find ways of resolving it. So we found that in one country, it was a Latin American country. But here was the interesting, um, like almost proxy side of it, like the other side of the coin. There was one country where they said, we now know, and this was the regulator, we now know that women are actually failing to access financial services, particularly credit, because they don't have access to collateral. The unfortunate bit, or okay, I would say, yeah, they have that knowledge, but it didn't come out of data analytics. So we were saying, well, this would have been very interesting if the Latin American country was the one that is saying from the data analytics, we could actually see that women are not accessing credit because of lack of collateral. So I will explain what the African country did. They actually created um, a policy and an activity, a project where the regulator says, okay, let's look at um, movable securities registers. So let's look at an alternative way of making sure that the collateral that the women have, this, this movable assets can actually be collateralized. And they started working on that project. So beautiful example of responding to issues that are happening. And that was really pleasing. The only thing we're saying to the regulator, you can do a lot more of that where you're taking the data and you're analyzing it. So one is the example that I could give as an opportunity. A lot of the FSPs are collecting complaints from their clients. 
Maybe the complaints even have something that says gender and they tick male, female. So if the FSPs can analyze that data by the sex and say, more women are complaining about this issue as opposed to men, or more men are complaining about this issue as opposed to women, then the regulator could actually collect that information, analyze it further, and go back to the FSPs and say, guys, can we do something about this? And maybe we make changes in this area. So this is just taking the complaints as one area where it's a low hanging fruit. A lot of the supervisors were already co collecting data. In some cases, the supervisors were even directly collecting complaints from the clients and it was sex disaggregated, but they were not really doing the analytics to say, so what are we learning from the women? What are the complaints which are unique to women as opposed to the men? And what do we do about it? So I've highlighted an example, one example of an opportunity, which I would even call a low hanging fruit because the data is there, it's sitting in some of the authorities, they can do a little bit more, and then they feed back to the FSPs so that you also incentivize the FSPs and they see why they should be collecting sex disaggregated data. I will stop here and hope I can explain further later on. Over to you, Lindsay. No, thank you so much, Petronella. That's that's really helpful. And like with many things, it just is a small tweak that could then, you know, really help to, to build out the, the data availability and, and data set. Um, turning to you, uh, Veronica, thinking about a kind of, again, very practical on the ground uh, examples. Can you tell us a little bit about how data analysis has helped me credit better understand the needs of your women clients and, and whether that's involved in, in more uh, developing better products or other types of services? Any examples that you can provide would be helpful. Um, thank you, Lisa. And, and well, we have before to go to the data analysis, we I want to explain that most of the clients in our country apply uh, through Facebook. But something that we saw is more men than women using Facebook. And also another thing that we saw, Instagram, uh, that another that using for men more than women um, but anyway we try to 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 educate the reason are one is low education that is one reason why the people don't use um, the network the social media secondly as um, uh, is because the country have a very good level to cell phone and those things but in the rural area is not a very good signal. And in fact, <laughs> recently I, I suffered for, for the internet. It was not good. <laughs> um, that are, that those reasons are the main reason why the women doesn't use. And the third reason is more women focus on their family, focus on their own business, more than the social media more than internet, more than Facebook. That's the, the, the reason. But we use the, the, the data to create product, of course. We normally build uh, almost through the questionnaires or through the survey. We have a call center to make interview after we made the loans. So in that moment, we build the data and, and also we follow the clients through the Facebook. One of the reasons when we decide to make any loan to the clients, we see the Facebook and we see their own uh, information, their personal information, because it's important to know what is the preference of women, es especially when we, may, when we receive from Facebook this um, information. Uh, Something that we learned with this data is reduce, one is reduce the cost because you, we don't spend a lot of time to see what is the necessity of the women, that one aspect. And the second aspect is, is, is short, is fast, is easy to, to see what the necessity of the women. 
One culture that we have here in Micredito is design the product from the point of view of the client and the data give this information. That is um, the, the, our support. But after the data, we make a short interview. We have another way more than data to design our product. I want to share a little bit uh, in a few, uh, in five minutes or not, no more, one minute. We create a, a culture in Micredito to design product from the point of view of the client, how we make an co annual competition for all the employees, all the employees, and, and they, they go through the data trying to create this product, what kind of product the client uh, need, because this competition at the end, there are a judge, see the product, explore the product, the product, and then we decide to, they have the employees, have, we choose three winners and they are exciting, but most of the information come from interview of the field and secondly for the data. Fantastic. I mean, that's that's so insightful in terms of I, I wasn't aware of the the shifts in the the usage of social media um, in Nicaragua and in, in particular. Um, and I think you know it's women do often have a lot of other things that they they have on their plate. So I, I'm not surprised to hear that that might be a part of the reason why there's different usage. But nonetheless, you know, it's fantastic that you're able to get that data, analyze it, and I love the idea of an annual competition you know, through your um, your workforce. I think that's fantastic. And of course, keeping clients at the center is, is so critical. Um, just thinking a little bit about looking forward and, and some of the challenges and, and opportunities. I'm just turning back to you, uh, Veronica. You know, just so much about microfinance is not, I mean, it's it's the product, it's the financial services provider and all the, the plumbing, which of course, you know, the folks that work with the Toronto Centre and others are, are interested in. But at the end of the day, I know, importantly, we really want to understand and think about impact. And so maybe if you could speak a little bit about, you know, what different some of your strategies and approaches have made in the lives of your women customers and you know what would you? We've got a, a a lot of people from the financial inclusion sector on the um, webinar today. You know, just what recommendations do you have for others? You know, to serve women customers in a in a better way. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, I think in, in microfinance, um, we have. The, the best tool that we have is the loan, the micro small loan. Probably everybody know this. Um, with a small loan, we change the life of the women. But it's, uh, for women, we have a specific products. What kind of product we have? For example, we call a uh, micro entrepreneur loan for women. That is women that they don't have employment or they have one idea, but nobody want to make any loan to them. So we decide according with the necessity, what kind of uh, loan normally women require. Water and sanitation is one. Improve their homes is second. Electricians or solar panel in the rural area is another one that we design according with the necessity of women and education for their children. Those kind of four loans, normally most of the women request to the credit. And also another service that we offer for women that is, uh, everybody know that is a diaspora come through United States or Spain, living from the country. So they receive remittances because most of the people go out of the country are men. So women stay here, continue their life with their children and they need receive remittances. That is another um, service. In the case of Costa Rica that we have uh, uh, branches there, they receive, we use the technology called to, um, it's a SIMPE. SIMPE is the name 
to transfer from one cell phone to another cell phone. That technology we are using in Costa Rica for made remittances. So we create that kind of product to facilitate women. Why? Because most of the women are in their own business, but at the same time, they take care of their children. They don't go outside. They are a state of the market or in their own house and they take their own business, but also they take care of their children. So they don't need, they, they need to spend time from the field to another branches is, is heavy for them. So what that kind of product we create to facilitate women in their culture. Another thing that is in, I want to mention in microfinance that we see, um, Normally in the rural area, women ask permission to their husband. And we say, why women may ask for permission to make loan or any service to the microfinance? So it's a, it's a culture, it's a, it's a culture problem that we have. And that is, is a consequence to take independent decision. If women make the loans and invest in their own business without permission of their husband, they can continue to uh, grow their, their business. But if the women if they re reject their permission for their husband, I would say stop their growth. So we try to create technology to, to make the, any application to reduce this kind of uh, problem, culture problem that we have. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Veronica. Those are really helpful, important uh, components. And, you know, it's certainly what we've heard, you know, in other countries as well, that often women are very much focused on the home, on, on you know, education for the children. I do think as well, certainly with the remittances, we know that that's one of the great opportunities for women. It, it just cutting down on the time, you know, assuming, and, and we haven't spoken about this, but that there is a, a good way to cash in and cash out with some of the transfers. Um, but what a fantastic um, set of examples of, of women-focused products. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, on International Women's Day, I don't think, you know, Nicaragua is alone in some of the challenges related to women being able to fully own their their own loans or their have their own uh, financial um, freedom, so to speak. Um, Petronella, just turning back to you, um, given that, again, we've got a lot of uh, people from the financial inclusion and regulatory and supervisory um, world here, you know, what advice would you give to financial regulators and supervisors to improve their data analytics and to harness the, the insights? You, you've given us a, a few examples previously, but if you could, you know, maybe wave a magic wand or, or provide some advice to everybody on the, the webinar, you know, given all the research that you've been doing in this space, uh, what would that be? So um, uh, the first one is really, something that we then captured in the toolkit. Uh, one of the barriers that uh, regulators face, and I would say that's maybe my word of advice, is that they don't quite see the business case from a regulatory perspective. So understanding the business case, why is it important from a regulatory perspective? Because the IMF uh, does in, in one of its papers, they, they do indicate that in, in markets where um, female managers are at the helm, either on boards or in senior management, there is evidence to show that financial market stability is enhanced. So if I were a regulator, well, which I'm not, and I've never worked there, um, if I were a regulator, I would be really interested in ensuring that the market that I'm regulating, the FSPs that I'm regulating, Maybe there's also even an element of having more women in leadership positions 
and see if that um, what we're seeing in other countries, if and see if it plays out also in your own country. And, and because it has an impact on market stability, I would say that maybe that's something that to be that's to be considered. And I would take it as um something that can be a starting point. So start by actually looking at the business case and understanding it from the business case perspective. The second area, which I would say is kind of, uh, again, using the term low hanging fruit and something that might be of interest for the regulators. We found out that some of the regulators, part of the challenge is just having the gender focus. Like maybe it's written on paper, but in reality, actually, they are not really paying a lot of attention. So I would challenge the regulators to walk the talk. So if you are interested in women inclusion, maybe even as a regulator, look at your own self and look at what you are doing for women inclusion, which includes the possibility that women are managers at the bank itself, at the regulator. So if you are a regulator for bankers, uh, and your central bank of Kenya, for example, how many women are in the leadership position of the bank itself and what is the impact it's making? So we found examples, for example, uh, like Zambia, they had actually taken that as a serious issue. They had put it in their strategy. They wanted to monitor how many women are in leadership positions at the bank, at the central bank itself. And in um, Colombia, they were also tracking how many of the women, both Zambia and Colombia, they were tracking how many female females are in boards of, of, of financial institutions. So if it's an insurance, if it's a, if it's a bank, how many women are in leadership positions and in their boards as a way of let's walk the talk. If we're expecting FSPs to do something for women, let's also see what we can do as the regulator to show that we are promoting the issue of financial inclusion. The third aspect, and that will be my last one, which we saw as a real challenge, is that um, uh, regulators are trying to have a balance. And uh, you know, Babak referred to this in the opening remarks. How do you balance uh, financial inclusion and maybe areas of innovation around that versus you know, just market stability issues? So I, I think that's a, a, a tough balance to maintain. And I would go back to the issue of the business case. If the regulator can find how paying attention to SDD, sex disaggregated data, how does that help me to be able to keep this balance? It, it, it will actually be one of the steps towards maintaining the balance. If you can see how the collection analysis and use of SDD is helping you in market stability and is helping you in, um, in other regulatory issues. Maybe from a risk-based perspective, you're going to focus a lot more on institutions that don't have many women on their boards as your starting point for risk-based supervision, maybe, maybe it's actually helping you in your supervisory work. And so if that happens, you are seeing the win-win in doing, in collecting and analyzing sex disaggregated data. Um, I think I've said a lot to challenge the financial regulators. I think they're gonna hammer me on the questions. Over to you, Lindsay. No, I, I don't think they will, because I think that you've made some some excellent points. And, you know, certainly looking at the the toolkits and the, the reports associated with it, it does come out very strongly that it is also a risk mitigation factor. And I'm going to add to what you said and just say, I'd like to see a lot more female central bankers. We only have a handful. Um, you know, obviously, the, the U.S. being a very important player. Um, so delighted to see that, but there's they're they're few and far between. And so when we do have women at that leadership role, we do naturally see a greater focus on this. It's not something strange or, you know, new that it's just, you know, I think women just tend to to think about these things um, just because it's very, very much natural. And that's also building on what Veronica said in the uh, financial services providers when they have, you know, when more women leaders or more women uh, credit officers, they get more women's clients. So it, it is a very much a win-win and, and lots of positive feedback. Um, so very excited to say we've got a number of questions in the um, Q&A, and I'm just going to start asking those out. And um, 
Uh, we'll um, take it from there, but also I encourage everyone that's listening, if you have any other questions or anything that's come up, please uh, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. So the first is from uh, Jose. Can you comment on what countries are the benchmark for sex disaggregated data? My understanding is that only Chile has been collecting this sort of data for the past 12 years. So Petronella, I think I'm gonna gonna pitch that one to you because you've been in the weeds of of thinking this through from a global perspective. Thank you for that one, Lindsay. Um, and, and yes, Chile is one of those countries, and we're looking at um, developing countries. So um, if you look at the countries that we're trying to do something uh, in terms of collection. I would say uh, Zambia goes in there as well. Um, Colombia goes in there. They were collecting a lot of uh, sex disaggregated data for credit. Who is accessing credit and who is not? I mean, you know, is it women? Is it men? So those were doing it. But in terms of benchmarks, you know, I, I wouldn't say we found we came across a benchmark. I think people are at different stages. The regulators. Are at different stages of maturity. Uh, we do talk in the in the in the uh, in the publication. We do talk about a continuum that you know you can look at regulators as. I think the end goal is to get them as champions of financial inclusion. Are they there yet? Maybe not. Uh, champions of financial inclusion for women. Let me add that. So are they there yet? Maybe not. But you see that they are on different stages of the continuum. So that's what we found, that many of the countries are at different stages. So they are on the road, but they are not yet there. So I wouldn't talk of benchmarks as of now, but uh, those two countries that I gave had very good examples of sex disaggregated data and different authorities were doing different things with different um, I'll give one example uh, of, of Zambia. Uh, there were two different authorities, financial services regulating authorities that were doing collecting data for different things. And I'll talk more about that later. I saw a question that is specifically about that. Over to you, Lindsay. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and this gets me to the, to the next question from Carol. Um, have we seen any evidence of how supervisors have changed policy as a result of analyzing sex disaggregated data from FSPs? Um, I'm going to turn that one back to you, Petronella, but I'd also love Veronica to comment a little bit because um, the second part of the question is really about whether um, FSPs, um, if there's any consultation with FSPs as part of that process. And it'd be interesting to hear any reflections she has as an FSP on engagement with the, the regulator and, and where the, the regulator and supervisor in, in uh, Nicaragua or Costa Rica or the other countries in which Micredito works, whether there's any um, uh, reflections on, on their engagement. So we'll do Petronella first and then to Veronica. Uh, thank you. So, um, so the I will go back to the Zambia example. There were two authorities in Zambia. Uh, I will talk about the one of the authorities that was collecting data um, from the FSPs, and the policy change that they made based on that data that they were collecting. They made a policy change which said when um, institutions are applying for licensing, they wanted to see how many women are in positions of leadership, either in senior management or at board level. So they made actually that change. They took it, they actually put it in the application form as a policy change to the application form. I think when we asked them the question about what would you do about the ones that are already licensed, if they are not uh, maybe like adhering to the policy, I think they are still in discussions in terms of maybe they give them time to work towards uh, what they were saying is the end goal. So it wasn't yet like a rule to say, if you don't have, so we will de-license you. But I think it was a very good um, example of a step that has been taken to ensure that they're actually using the data and making policy changes and explaining to the people that, you know, when you actually applying for a license we would like to see the positions of authority that are held by women in that particular um, institution um colombia was uh, collecting data on um 
credit and they wanted to see, so they, 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 they had uh, issues around products and services. So if an FSP is coming and they're looking at product, uh, uh, introducing a product and they're saying this product is for women, for example, they would look at, um, they were looking at that data and the, the results they got from the data to influence um, the parameters that they would use to give a no objection to uh, products and services that would then be launched for women. So those were the two examples that we found. Maybe there are a lot more in the report, but those are the two that, uh, that come to mind right away. Over to you, Lindsay. Thank you so much. That that's really really helpful. And and just before I jump to uh, Veronica to talk about from the FSP perspective, um, Jose has just noted as well that Chile produces data on credit by type, uh, savings, and even interest rates. It has monthly data. So I think you know one of the fantastic things about the Toronto Center is it's very much a platform for peer to peer learning. So thank you very much, Jose, and and I know others will will look to the example of uh, of Chile. Um, Veronica, any reflections on how you engage with the regulator on sex disaggregated data? Have they made any requirement from you on this, or just your reflections? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Lincoln. Yeah. Well, in the case of Nicaragua, we is 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 really the law. The law is not allowed to use that kind of um, data. We create um, inside of each organization. For example, in Nicaragua, there is just one organization with the, this uh, kind of service, a hundred percent. The rest is a mix between current service and the database service, because the law doesn't allow to take this as a product to design uh, as a product. So we design from the disaggregate the database, but inside of our organization, then we have to complete the rest of the process because the law have this limitation. In the case of Costa Rica, it's a little bit different because Costa Rica is more, have more financial inclusion in general, have more open um, law, but is it still, um, is it still a small group in microfinance? And the banks, 100% of the bank are using it. But in microfinance for poor people, is a very limited group of the organization disaggregate, including Micredito. It's a, in a piece of the, of the group of the of the product that we have, we can use, but it's because the law doesn't allow it. Thank you. So I, you know, I think each country is still, as as Petronella said, on their their journey, and you know, hopefully we'll be able to again through through sharing of experience and best practice help to to shift some of these uh, these uh, challenges. Um, while I have you here, Veronica, a couple questions came up about um, internet connectivity and, and some of the challenges of, of digital financial services. Um, you, you mentioned that internet reliability is an issue. Um, is access to a mobile device an issue as well for some of your clients in, uh, in the countries in which you work? And is access to a branch network important as well? You know, are you able to go mostly digital with some kind of cash in, cash out mechanism, or is is the branch and and your loan officers doing outreach still critical to your model? Well, the the mobile phone is using in, for example, the population of Nicaragua is six point seven million. The mobile phone in Nicaragua is seven million, so more mobile phone than than population. But the thing is that um, most of the mobile phone is using just for call. Hello, how are you? And that's it. <laughs> and, and there are few, the young people is using uh, Instagram, Facebook, and those uh, media, social media is using. But poor people, because the education, because uh, they don't know very well this uh, social media, they don't use that. Um, but in Micredito, we create um, training for our clients through the uh, internet, through the, okay. uh, for example, the final education, we send a small video to the WhatsApp 
and the, all the client receive from the WhatsApp. That is one way to improve the capacity to learn. It's easy, it's free, um, it's cheaper in some time. <laughs> so we create that kind of scene, some uh, mechanism because the, with the limitation of the country. We have cell phone, we have internet, but it's not as good as the, in Nicaragua. In the case of Costa Rica, is more improved. We see we made service, for example, the client can pay their own uh, uh, amount monthly, they can pay through the cell phone. We call Simpe, and they send in, in, in second, send their own payment from the field any place in Costa Rica. So those different are between in Costa Rica and Nicaragua that we have been working on that. Thank you so much. Um, just jumping back to uh, Yasmin's question and picking up on something you said earlier, Petronella, um, just on, on the issue related to customer complaints. Um, just related to that, what is the role of the regulator to encourage customer feedback? And are regulators doing anything to let customers know that their voices will be heard, um, particularly for women customers? Uh -huh. So uh, before I uh, before I, I answer that question, I just want to clarify something. So sex disaggregated data is being collected widely. Actually, there are lots of countries, even Peru, it was our, another country of study, Bangladesh, they're collecting the data. Our challenge was looking at it from the regulatory perspective. Are they collecting it just to push the financial inclusion agenda or are they actually collecting it as part of their work to inform supervision, to inform regulations and that connection. So that's why I said it was, so just to clarify, I, I wanted to just clarify that point that a lot of the institutions were doing that. Now back to your question, Lindsay, uh, is the question about uh, cu cu customer complaints. So we found that in some jurisdictions, the regulator plays a role in uh, collecting complaints and they actually make it public that the uh, the public can can actually complain they they have um, lines available toll free lines and this was something that was happening they were actually collecting um, complaints from the from the customers i'll give an example of what uh, rwanda was doing uh, during COVID, and this was not a country of study. I'm just uh, giving an example from my own experience. And they, what they did was they put champions into the villages. And these champions were actually talking about, you know, like young people who are working as champions and they're talking about financial literacy. And as part of that, they were also including, well, if you have gone to a financial service provider and you are not happy, please hear yeah, the numbers to complain. They would give uh, the information as to how do you can, how do you even get in touch with the supervisor? Um, in in uh, another example, I can't remember whether it was uh, Zambia, they were uh, on, on TV uh, publicizing, some were taking even advantage of the Global Money Week to publicize. I know, for example, in Zimbabwe, they use the Global Money Week to publicize how you can uh, complain. So two areas of deficit. One is um, not necessarily does the media encourage women to complain. So I'll give an example of a woman who is a rural woman, who is illiterate. So if you come up on TV and you flash the numbers and say, you can call us on these numbers, maybe the women don't know about it because they don't watch TV. As Veronica said, they have lots of things that they are looking, uh, that they are handling responsibilities. They may not go on TV, they may not go on Facebook. So something that would need to be done is to really make sure that the authorities are looking at gender-friendly methods, women-friendly methods of data collection, women-friendly methods that will enable the women to complain. Women might want to just speak to a physical person. How does the regulator ensure that that can happen? Um, and then uh, I think the second part of the question was to do with, uh, is there any way of feedbacking? I think we found an example of one of the uh, uh, jurisdictions where they were ensuring that there is feedback to the clients and they also explained to us that 
even for the FSPs, they require the financial service providers to actually show that they gave feedback, they provided feedback to the client, and that's something that they, they emphasized. So there was a way of making sure that there's feedback to the customers. Um, those are the examples I can, I can give. Over to you, Lindsay. No, I think those those are great. And I'm just going to circle back with one other question, though, for you, Petronella, that came up. And um, it might be controversial given the, the crowd, but it's that financial regulators and supervisors are inherently risk averse. Um, is there a presumption that financial inclusion is risky in nature? And therefore, should we be um, having our financial inclusion uh, programs uh, being led or hosted by um, within regulatory institutions. Very interesting one. And I think Afi would be like, no, they have to do it. And a lot of the regulators I am familiar with, even the ones we spoke to, they were all driving the financial inclusion agenda. So I, th I think that question of them driving the financial inclusion agenda I think by and large is sort of resolved. They, they fully understand the impact of financial inclusion from, uh, because they're the ones who are regulating this, the, the financial sector. If they are out of it and they are not really driving it, they'll probably undermine it. So I think they, they, they will undermine it unknowingly, if I may use that word, because they can come up with policies which will hinder financial inclusion. So it's really, I'm happy that we have pushed the back to where it belongs. They will struggle with it because it's actually creating this controversy. And I, I think I like it. In some countries, when this started, and I will speak for Zimbabwe, when the issue of financial inclusion being driven by central bank started, the central bank was seeing it as a peripheral issue and it has nothing to do with the main core mandate of the regulator. But over time, they've actually come to realize that is the front and center, because if half of the population, 70% of the population is excluded, you, you may even fail to have institutions to regulate because they won't be there because you don't have the population, they don't have the customers. So they, they actually, um, it, 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 I would say it is an interesting uh, dichotomy. It's an interesting controversy and let it stay there and let them push it in the countries we spoke to they are now, I think, okay with that being part of their mandate. In fact, we did a mapping and it's in the report and that matrix, the web, the web mapping, where we were showing the financial inclusion focus, the gender focus, and we were mapping them, the maturity of the sector, and a lot of them scored high on the financial inclusion agenda. I think we're now pushing the frontier to say it's not just financial inclusion financial inclusion for women so we put, keep pushing the frontier and that's what that's what financial inclusion is about we keep pushing the frontier after the women will bring another thing and we keep push the, pushing the frontier thank you Lindsay over to you thank over you so you. much thank you so much uh Petronella I think that's that's really helpful we're, we're getting near the end um, just one quick question for Veronica, uh, maybe just briefly, there was another question about the application process, but just, you know, maybe a couple of words on, um, on privacy and, you know, when we are talking about collecting data, um, are there any privacy concerns? You mentioned that you shared um, or you, you follow your clients on Facebook. So just maybe just a, a quick word on privacy and then I'll, I'll sum things up. Well, thank you. Thank you. Listen, uh, well, it's not follow their private <laughs> life. It's just their preference. When we review in the Facebook, we want to understand their culture, their preference, because we want to design the, the, their, their point of view of them, the product. In, in mi credito, we normally try to listen the client in different way, a survey, interview, uh, phone call, then Facebook to understand why, because most of them, they are uh, shy, they, they don't want to share their, they think they don't have opportunity uh, to grow. 
that's uh, an essence that, that we have been doing. And also we rec recognize their uh, children, they are seeing, we say, oh, they need education, they need house improving, they need electricity, and that's uh, the, the way, is is no to smell their yeah. <laughs> private life. <laughs> Thank you for the question to clarify. No, th Thank you so much, uh, Veronica. That's very helpful. Well, first of all, huge thank you to Veronica Petronella and the Toronto Centre for this opportunity to discuss this really important issue. I think we've learned a lot about the importance of sex disaggregated data. We've learned a lot about the importance of collecting it to help design products. Uh, similarly, the, the increased ease and um, Use of that data is much more likely when uh, women are in the driver's seat and also women are playing important leadership roles in financial services providers, but also in uh, the supervisory space. Um, I think one of the things that really resonated uh, with me as well was the, the issue of win-win. You know, we maybe don't need to think of financial inclusion being contrary to uh, risk-based supervision. You know, it's, it's an important element of it. And if we do look at the entire um, uh, clientele for, for access to finance or in the financial sector, if we're not including women, then we're missing out and, and not going to do as good a job, I think, as, as uh, financial service providers, but also supervisors and regulators. And so with that, I just want to say big thank you to our panelists. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of their International Women's Day. And it's been an honor to speak with you all today. Thank you so much.